if you're an athlete and you're eating high quality food, you don't really need to load up on any protein powders. You can easily meet your protein needs through food. I'm Robin Sussingham, and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and Southern charm were all about food in Florida. Back to school means back to school sports. Today, we check in with a Florida boarding school for serious student athletes who put in hours a day training in their sport. We find out what they've learned about food as fuel. Support for the Zest Podcast comes from Seitenbacher brand natural foods like muesli cereals, oils, oatmeal, energy bars, gluten-free fruit gummies for the kids, organic coffee, and more. Available in supermarkets, health food stores, or online at seitenbacher.com. I wanted to make sure that you know about stpetersburgfoodies.com. If you're looking for fun and good food in St. Pete, there are restaurant reviews and podcasts featuring local chefs, restaurateurs, happy hour suggestions, and a lot more. It's all online at stpetersburgfoodies.com. For young athletes who are serious about their sport, granola bars and orange slices just won't do it. You'll find lots of those athletes in Bradenton, which is home to IMG Academy, a boarding school where elite middle and high school athletes live, study, train, and eat. The campus also welcomes college athletes, pros, and amateur adults. Jackie Barcel is IMG's head of nutrition, and she spoke with the Zest Dalia Cologne about how to fuel young athletes, and she offered up some tips for the rest of us. Dalia has a personal interest in this subject. She has two young kids, and if you listen closely to the interview, you'll hear them bursting into the closet where Dalia's recording the interview. Yes, the closet, because we're all working from home right now. What are the nutritional needs of a student athlete versus any other middle school or high school or college student? When we think of your normal, I would just say your stereotypical high school student, they probably aren't training three to four times a day unless they're a very active kid. And so as a parent, you know, obviously you're probably concerned with your kids' overall health, their growth, and their development, and nutrition is going to play a huge role in that. And so just for the average youth individual, you know, they're growing at such a fast rate that nutrition is going to be so important. And then on top of that, you throw on the added stresses that sport brings and physical activity, and then the sheer duration of how long they're training. So our athletes here at the academy And we do, we are doing a a better job of trying to manage their workload too. So we have those off days and high days and low days to where they aren't going full out every single day, but they're doing something with their sport three to four hours a day, most likely most days of the week. And so when we look at that, making sure that they're meeting their nutritional needs, overall calories is going to be first and foremost, the more, most important thing, because for these athletes to reach their full potential in not only sport, but in academics and just overall health and well-being, they have to be meeting their nutrition needs and they have to also be meeting them for growth. So unlike an adult who's fully grown and they're working on maintenance, we're talking about young individuals whose bones um, and their bodies are still developing and, and not to mention their brains as well. And so that's one thing we try to emphasize to the kids too is, you know, at this stage in the game, making sure that they're eating every three to four hours at least is going to be key to really meeting their nutritional needs. And then also from a, you know, inflammation standpoint, a recovery standpoint, I think that's the biggest difference, right? If you take a a recreational athlete, a young person who's training maybe three days a week for an hour or two hours, they probably have enough time to recover in between their intense training sessions and they're going to be okay. But when you're training day in and day out, it's really a game of recovery. And so making sure these athletes are getting what they need throughout the day so they can go out the next morning and do it all over again is, again, just going to be really important. So what are some guidelines for what they should be eating? Because most teenagers I know are already eating nonstop, but it's not Mm -hmm. necessarily food that's going to fuel them. 
Right. And you know, IMG Academy athletes are human too. And they're just like every other kid. And, you know, even at the college and pro levels, it's still a challenge to probably get them to make the best decisions for their body. So in general, we really want to focus on getting a good source of whole grains. So whole grain pasta, brown rice, whole grain breads, Beans are, are a great one too. Again, I'm talking about a lot of carbohydrates. Obviously, these kids are very active. And so making sure they're choosing that versus maybe more of the processed stuff, like obviously chips, soda, candy are, are very common. You know, a lot of kids that I work with, they like Takis and Skittles and, you know, just gummies. And, and they think that's a meal and they think that's a snack. And really our job as educators is to help motivate them to make that better decision and and are they going to do it all the time of course not even us as adults we struggle to make the best fueling choices a hundred percent of the time but we like to guide them you know if they've got three meals a day seven days a week you've got 21 meals and so can you make 18 of those meals really nutrient dense get a good source whole grain a lean protein and lots of colorful fruits and vegetables you mentioned you have kids as well. I think the carbohydrate component and the protein component usually aren't big issues for a lot of the kids that that I work with, but it's the colorful fruits and vegetables, which can really be a challenge. But that's what we call our performance plate. So about a third of the, the plate, whole grains, about a third to, you know, maybe a fourth of the plate, lean, low fat protein. We don't want to get a lot of those high fat proteins in there just because of the saturated fat and the inflammation that that may uh, contribute to. And then really the, the colorful fruits and vegetables. A good rule of thumb we like to tell our kids is try to get at least three to four different colors on the plate. Three to four colors on the plate. So do the students live on campus? Are they given their meals or are they preparing their own meals? Yeah, so I would say about 80% of our kids do live on campus. So it is home home to them. It's a boarding school and we do become more like, you know, their parents and their families and and really their support system because they are here. Uh, One thing that I didn't mention earlier is that we have kids from over 80 different countries on campus. So we have a very diverse student population and our food and beverage department, we've got a, a dining facility called the Servery on campus. It's not your typical chicken nuggets and tater tots and then, you know, pizza 24 seven. There's a good variety. So there's always lean proteins available. Um, We have one of the most amazing salad bars that I've ever seen with beans. We've got deli meat. And so basically the kids go through the servery and they pick out their own food. We really do give them autonomy to pick what they want to eat. And that can be really great. But then also, again, if you're thinking about a 13 or 14 year old, if mom and dad aren't there saying, this is going to be the best option. We really have to try to find ways to motivate them to make the better, better fueling choice. Oh, yeah, that's tough because I think about going to sleepaway camp when I was younger or when you go off to college, you gain the freshman 15. I think I ate like nothing yep. but cereal <laughs> and ice cream <laughs> for like all of my freshman year. Let's talk about protein because there seems to be an emphasis on getting enough protein. How much is too much? There are the powders and the supplements and the sort of heavy protein diets. What are some guidelines for the right amount of protein? And that's definitely been a hot topic recently. And, you know, young athletes, because they're growing, they are going to need a little bit more protein. And then obviously the more you're trained, the more muscle breakdown you have. So making sure you get good, high quality protein is going to be important. As far as quantity goes, you know, what we usually like to, t- to tell the athletes, it's not only about how much you eat, but also when you eat. So in my experience working with athletes and really just even adults too, they eat little to nothing in the morning. They might get, you know, five to 10 grams, maybe at lunch through like a turkey sandwich or something. And then they just load up on dinner. You think of the, the ribeyes and the steaks and the big chicken dinners. And so really they've shifted a lot of their protein and just overall calorie intake to the evening when really we try to get them to emphasize it in the morning. And we call that our backwards fueling pattern is when you eat very little in the morning and then kind of load up at night. And so when we're talking about quantities, we try to recommend 
about 20 to 30 grams of high quality protein every three to four hours. Things like grilled chicken breasts, lean turkey, especially for our female athletes on campus, iron is a huge concern. So we definitely encourage our kids, you know, when there's flank steak out there or getting a good source of red meat to help with that iron intake. And then also for the vegetarians and vegans, doing things like beans is going to be really important. You can also get it, obviously this wouldn't be vegan, but you can get it through dairy as well. Are there differences in diets for different sports? So would a defensive lineman on the football team need different fueling than, say, a tennis player or a swimmer? Potentially, yes. I mean, if you compare a defensive lineman, they may need about four, maybe 5,000 calories a day to maintain their weight. Um, and then if you think of a tennis athlete, in general, they're, they're probably going to be a little bit leaner, you know, just in general. But that doesn't mean that they don't also need maybe four to 5,000 calories a day just because of the sheer um, intensity of tennis and how long a tennis match might last. So you know, a defensive lineman, they, a play lasts five seconds. Um, and they may do that in handful of times, whereas a tennis athlete might be consistently running for three hours, um, not including their warm up. And so all of these things, all these components come into play. And so when we're talking about energy needs for youth athletes, we, we also encourage them making sure you're staying in tune with your hunger levels and with your energy levels as well. Like, are you experiencing chronic fatigue all the time? You know, are you recovering? Have you, have you had reoccurring injuries? And those are all things that we would consider when assessing the needs of an athlete. So if you're talking about a 17 year old defensive lineman versus a, a 12 year old tennis player, but then again, at the same time, if that 12 year old tennis player is about to shoot up three or four inches, as I'm sure we've all seen, you know, kids do before. Sometimes I don't even recognize these kids when they come back from summer because they've grown so much. Those two athletes, although physically they look like they may be very different uh, because of where they are and their stage of training, they, they may actually need very similar calories. Ah, interesting. You talked about vegetarian and vegan diets and different diets for different sports. Are there other dietary restrictions you're seeing? It seems like allergies are a big thing these days, and I don't know if there are more kids with allergies or it's, you know, more diagnosed now or what's going on. But how do you address allergies and other dietary restrictions that student athletes bring to the table, so to speak? Really just working with the athlete and figuring out, okay, what's the main issue here? And then sometimes we do try stuff out. Like if, if they notice they experience a stomach upset every time they eat dairy, then, okay, maybe let's try taking it out and see if you notice a change. They could just be saying, you know, hey, I'm tired all the time. I think it's because I'm eating gluten. And then when we take a better look at it, maybe they're only eating one to two times a day. They're getting seven hours of sleep. You know, school is stressful and they've got all these other things that are probably contributing to that fatigue a little bit more than than probably the gluten. We're seeing an increase and I, I think there's probably a level of, you know, gluten is one of them as well that, that I've seen come up again and again. And there may be more people out there who are gluten sensitive, not maybe full-blown celiac to where they have an autoimmune reaction to it, but potentially sensitive to where it's dose dependent. And I know a lot of kids too, they, they tend to overeat on pasta and bread and, and could probably have two or three sandwiches at a time and, and a whole bag of chips. And they say they get a stomach upset, but then it's like, okay, well, did you actually just eat too much food in general? And that's why you're feeling sick? Hmm. Yeah, it would be disappointing to work out for four hours a day and then realize I can't just have a bowl of pasta. <laughs> right. This just occurred to me when you talked about kids overindulging in pasta and chips do you ever see the opposite, you know, eating disorders where people don't want to eat enough? Yes, all the time. And I would actually say the the underfueling um, as a nutrition team, there's myself actually, and we have, you know, there's four dietitians on staff. So there's myself and three others. And that's probably as a department, our bigger concern, right? So if you think, you know, our kids are go into school or sport in the morning and then they either go to school or sport in the afternoon and lunch is a quick turnaround time and they've got 
homework afterwards, projects, not to mention getting a social life, right? So they're basically living the college lifestyle only in high school. And so our kids are really learning a lot of skills early on. And one of that is making sure that they get enough to eat. So for us, eating disorders, under fueling is a huge concern. And that's so we often have to tell kids, set a reminder on your phone, right? Set that alarm for every three to four hours just to remind yourself or remind yourself at night before you go to bed to pack a couple, you know, protein bars or snacks or maybe some beef jerky, trail mix, something that's going to keep in your backpack so you have a snack for during school too. Oh, that's good. What are some other ideas for quick snacks? I'm always looking to like set it and forget it, you know, create a snack that my kids can either make on their own or just grab and go. Mm -hmm. We love to, you know, recommend trail mix is a great one. So dried fruit, nuts, seeds, because you're getting a really great variety and it's an easy way to get in fruit. I know as a former athlete, sometimes I would stick a banana in my backpack or I, I played softball and soccer a lot and you stick it in your gym bag. And then by the end of the day, it's rotten and it smells. And then your bag smells like a banana for the rest of the day. And so trail mix is just so portable and it's got the healthy fats too with the nuts and the seeds. Um, so important. So those are some beef jerky is a great one or turkey jerky is good. You know, a lot of people think, oh, it's too high in sodium or isn't it high in fat? But actually the sodium is excellent for these kids, especially when they're so active. And here in Florida, I mean, you know how hot and humid the sodium is actually really important to help with hydration when, when you pair it with fluids. So getting salty snacks is good. You know, something you can do at home, you know, especially during the summer months is, is Greek yogurt. So what I often like to do is do Greek yogurt, berries, um, you can throw in nuts, you can throw in some almond butter or something in it. And I actually like to stick mine in the freezer for about an hour or so. And it freezes up a little bit just like, you know, frozen yogurt or ice cream. Now, by no means is it, is it exact replacement for ice cream. So if you're expecting to get that ice cream taste, you might be a little disappointed, but I actually like it a lot and it's pretty similar. So that's something quick that you can do. Also at home too, what I've found uh, some athletes doing too is egg bites. And so if you take a muffin tin and just crack an egg in each one, you can throw in bell peppers, spinach, mushrooms, you know, you can do chicken sausage and you can cook them ahead of time and then just throw them in the fridge. And it's such a quick, easy snack that the kids can just pull out and you can eat it cold or they can microwave it for 10, 15 seconds, stick it on like a whole grain English muffin or maybe in a whole wheat tortilla or something. It makes a really good, quick snack as well. Turkey cheese roll-ups are another good, quick one. And then I always like to tell parents, just have fruit and maybe some like baby carrots are, are usually an easy one or an easier one for kids or, or celery, peanut butter and raisins. The, the good old fashioned ants on a log is another good one. And just having it out and available. And then the kids are likely to go and grab it. You know, if you've got a bowl of fruit sitting there, maybe some grapes. Wow. Those are some great tips for all ages, athletic or not. You talked about staying hydrated in the Florida heat, which is just the absolute worst. Yeah. Do you have any other tips on the hydration needs of student athletes, um, especially if they're exercising outside? Is there a place for those energy drinks and sports drinks or should they just stick with water? Yeah. So big difference between energy drinks and then um, the sports drinks, the energy drinks, we really don't know what they have in them. Usually a lot of caffeine and then a lot of unnecessary vitamins and herbs and minerals. Um, so there's actually quite a few, I, I, I wouldn't say quite a few, and I can't quote a number specifically, but there's an increase in usage of energy drinks, especially within our teen population. And it's very dangerous because you're elevating your heart rate with all the caffeine. And then what's more concerning is the other stuff too that's within those energy drinks that amplifies the effects of the caffeine, right? So some of us might have an energy drink and we feel a lot more, you could say like revved up or awake or you feel the effects of it a lot more than if you were just have black coffee, right? And what the thought is a lot of those other ingredients and you might see the term proprietary blend on a label. And that's basically a, a fancy way for a company just to hide 
its formula within there and not and say we're not going to tell you what's actually in it and so that might actually amplify the effects of the caffeine so we want to stay away from energy drinks um, stay away from the caffeine especially within the youth as you get a little bit older like college and pros there is definitely a time and a place for caffeine and it has been shown to uh, delay fatigue especially during high intensity now again this is all dose dependent and you want to make sure that you're not overdoing it because everyone has different tolerances when it comes to hydration, you know, in Florida specifically, there's definitely a time and a place for electrolyte beverages and sports drinks. What I've found is that kids don't always use it appropriately, right? Or athletes just in general don't use the sports drinks appropriately. So a good recommendation is about four to six ounces. So you're thinking about half to three fourths of a cup every 15 to 20 minutes once you're in a hot human environment or your training session is longer than 60 minutes. In general, if you're not training for more than 60 minutes, it's light intensity, you could probably just stick with water or a no calorie electrolyte beverage. Cause right, even if it's not intense, I mean, you walk outside right now in Florida and you're probably sweating a lot, which means you're losing fluid, sodium, and then also chloride or together being salt. So if you've ever tasted your sweat before, it's very salty. And so what we want to do is focus on getting those electrolytes in while we're training. If you didn't want to do a sports drink and you're like, no, I just want to stay away from those added sugars, that's fine. But you have to find a way to get in those carbohydrates and electrolytes. And so what I would typically recommend is maybe like something like a Propel that doesn't have any of the added sugar. It's got the electrolytes and then maybe bring some pretzels out to practice with you. I know everyone, like a lot of soccer players, I grew up, you know, eating bananas and orange slices. And then a lot of tennis athletes will go towards the banana. You see it in the U.S. Open and and tennis tournaments from the pros too, which is fine. It's not a bad choice, but it's probably not ideal. Pretzels and crackers are going to be probably the best option because you've got the carbs and you've got the salt. What about smoothies? The gyms are always trying to get you to buy a smoothie on your way out. Is there any benefit to yes. that? Yes, there can be, depending on what's in the smoothies, right? So you mentioned also, and I didn't address this earlier, but like protein powders. If you're an athlete and you're eating high quality food, you don't really need to load up on any protein powders. You can easily meet your protein needs through food. We always take a food first approach here at the academy, especially with our youth athletes. Now, the benefits of a smoothie, especially right after a workout, is it's liquid, so it's going to get digested fast, which means that protein and the carbs and all that fluid is going to get delivered to your muscles a lot faster than if you were to go out and eat a meal, right? If you think about it, right after a workout, if you know you're going to have to go out the next day or maybe for in our kids' case, maybe you've got another tennis match or soccer or, you know, maybe you're playing a doubleheader in baseball and, you know, you've got to go play again in a couple hours, that smoothie could actually serve a great benefit of rehydrating you, refueling your body with carbohydrates, and then also helping to rebuild your muscles with that protein that's in in the smoothie. So they can definitely serve a purpose. And you talked earlier too about kids not having an appetite or maybe not wanting to eat. And high intense physical activity can actually suppress our hunger hormones. Um, And some of us may experience that too, right? We go work out and then we're just not really hungry to eat. And then you amplify that with the heat too. You're like, man, I just don't feel like eating a hot meal right now. I'm so exhausted. I'm so tired. A smoothie is a great way to kind of bounce back and still get the nutrients you need without completely uh, forcing yourself to eat a full meal. Hmm. Last beverage question. What about chocolate milk? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of talk in the last couple of years about how chocolate milk is the perfect recovery beverage. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, it does make a great recovery beverage and here's why. So there's nothing magical about it. It's kind of like that smoothie that we just talked about. It has what we call the three R's of recovery. And we use this when we do recovery sessions or education with our student athletes. It's refuel, rebuild, and rehydrate. Those are the three components. So as long as you have those three components within your recovery snack or meal, then you've chosen a great thing. And so the thing with chocolate milk is it fits all the three R's. It has carbs, it has protein, 
and it has uh, the fluids and electrolytes. And so that's why it's been recommended. And, and we see it a lot on commercials too, as being great for recovery. Okay. So a lot of the kids you work with, I mean, if they're living on a sports campus for school, they're probably intending to go pro. What are the pro athletes that you know eating? Do they have any strange food rituals? I think I read that LeBron James eats a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah, that's great. Um, I have worked, you know, quite a bit with some pros on, on campus. Some of them will have different rituals. Like they always have this before. They'll always have this for breakfast. I don't know if any of them are weird. More is just like superstition. Like I'm always going to have oatmeal with berries and a glass of milk before I go compete. I would say the biggest difference between our youth athletes and our pro athletes is the focus on routines. Whereas kids are still learning that they're still learning how to stay consistent. I would say our pro athletes have got that down. And that's probably one of the reasons why they're a pro, right? A lot of us formed habits when we were student athletes. You know, I ran track in high school and I did gymnastics. I'm not doing those things now. Now we're, we're pretty sedentary, but our eating habits haven't caught up yet. How can we former student athletes get back on track? It's tough because especially when you go from so much activity and then you're like, whoa, I can't eat the same way as I used to. And so what we typically recommend is, you know, you can still eat every three to four hours. It usually just comes down to portion sizes, right? The biggest mistake I see adults make is they say, oh, I'm just going to skip breakfast or I'm not going to have a snack or I'm going to skip this meal or just do a replacement shake because, you know, that's easy and it's going to get me to my goals faster. But it usually ends up backfiring. Yeah. A lot of those snacks you recommended for the students to keep in their backpack we should probably be keeping in our desk drawer, like the trail mix. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. And do be careful with trail mix, I would say, because I know I used to have actually a thing of trail mix sitting under my desk in college. And while I was studying it and stuff at my desk, I would just reach in there and take a couple handfuls. And I think that's one thing that also transfers into adulthood, right? Like those habits, like you mentioned, they, they stay with us. And I feel like that's what's such an important about my job, you know, educating the youth is getting them to develop those good habits. So it's not as tough of a transition when they get older, but the trail mix can be very high in calories. So just monitor uh, portion sizes. I know sometimes all we have is like five minutes, right. To eat a snack, maybe in between meetings. And so bars aren't ideal, but doing like a bar that's has all nuts in it or has, um, you know, a good lean, high quality protein in it. I know Kind Bars are a good one. RX Bars are another great option um, that we recommended that you can just have, you know, during a meeting. String cheese is great. Greek yogurt is another good one. Fruit's a good option. It won't have the protein, but obviously very, very nutrient dense as well. And then finally, what's the role of sleep in nutrition? Is sleep as important as what we're eating when it comes to overall overall being able to fuel our bodies? Yes, definitely. Actually, all our hunger hormones are regulated during sleep. And so a lot of people who get, you know, fewer than eight hours of sleep might have a harder time managing their hunger. You might just wake up in the morning and then throughout the day, man, I'm I'm just hungry all day. I can't stop eating. I don't know why. And, you know, it could be for a variety of reasons, but one thing to look at is definitely sleep and then sleep quality too. So you might be in bed for 10 hours, but I don't know, as someone with kids, you know, I'm sure they're not, you know, silent throughout the whole night. Or if you've got really young kids and they come in waking you up in the middle of the night, it's not only how much you sleep, but it's also the quality of your sleep as well. So definitely important to get enough sleep. And I know for some of us too, after a long day, we get home And, you know, we just want to veg out and chill and watch TV and probably just relax. However, we just have to be mindful of, okay, if I'm watching TV or if I'm going to go do a a Netflix binge, am I eating, you know, a whole bucket of popcorn or am I bringing that bag of chips from the kitchen with me to the couch? A good rule of thumb is never eat straight out of the bag. Always put it in a smaller container just to help manage portion sizes. But yes, yeah, sleep sleep is definitely important. I know it's something challenging, especially with the, you know, cell phones attached at our hip. I tell myself every night, you know, 30 minutes before bed, an hour before before bed, just put it away because that blue light can actually interfere with sleep. 
Oh, these are such great tips. I wish I could tell my younger self. Is there anything else we didn't talk about that you want to mention? You know, I would just say, you know, just to kind of summarize is, you know, if you're looking to make a, a change in your diet, small baby steps. I like to tell, you know, people when I'm working with an athlete, if your kid isn't eating any vegetables right now, I'm not going to tell him or her to eat seven vegetables in a week because that's just not realistic. I'm going to give them a realistic goal. Let's get in one this week. Okay. We did that next week. Let's get in two and really meet the athlete where they're at and then push them forward. Right. Just like a coach would, you're not going to take a recreational athlete and turn them into a pro overnight. So I can't expect to take any person from a recreational eater and, you know, turn them into a, a pro fueler overnight either. So I think big picture, just try not to look for, for quick fixes. The best thing is something that you can really sustain your whole life. That's great. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for all the great advice for our kids and ourselves. Um, we'll try to take it with baby steps one day at a time. Thank you so much. That was Dalia Colon speaking with Jackie Barcel of IMG Academy. Jackie shared ideas for some grab-and-go foods that are perfect for student athletes and adults, too. You can find the recipes for egg muffin bites, overnight oatmeal, and a tropical protein smoothie on our website, thezestpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. I'm Robin Sessingham. Dalia Cologne and I produce The Zest with help from Cheyenne Jaglal and Mark Hayes. Copyright 2020, WUSF Public Media, University of South Florida.